Here in this section, we have one-sided limit theorem. Suppose that the function f is defined on an open interval containing c except perhaps at c itself, then f of x has a limit as x approaches c if and only if it has left-hand and right-hand limits, and these one-sided limits are equal. So limit of f of x as x approaches c equal to l, so this limit exists if and only if limit of f of x as x approaches c from left that is equal to l and limit of f of x as x approaches c from right that is also equal to l. Now what we have here in part A and B, we have graph for this function f of x. In part A, as x approaches c from right, limit of f of x is equal to l. And what we have in part B, as x approaches c from left, limit of f of x is equal to m. The following function has a right hand limit 0 at x equal to negative 2 and left hand limit 0 at x equal to positive 2. So limit of f of x as x approaches negative 2 from right is 0 and limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from left is 0. Use the graph below to determine the right hand limit at x equal to negative 3, right hand and left hand limit at x equal to 0. Limit of f of x as x approaches negative 3 from right, that is equal to 9, this point, because of having this point on this graph. But limit of f of x as x approaches negative 3 from left does not exist. Limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from left. The point that we have here on y-axis is that point, it's 0, 3, so the answer is 3. Limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from right. Again, see what point you have on y-axis, and again is this one. We have 0, 3, so the answer is D. Because of having same answer for left and right hand limits, so these are equal to, that means limit of f of x as x approaches 0 exists, and that is this point on this graph. So limit of f of x as x approaches 0 is 0. So when x approaches 0, we were able to find a limit of f of x, but when x approaches negative 3, we're not able to find limit of f of x because left hand and right hand limits are not equal to. So these two are not equal to. What that means, limit of f of x as x approaches negative 3 does not exist. Use the graph below to determine the right hand and left hand limits at x equal to 4. So limit of f of x as x approaches 4 from left is based on this part of graph. And the point that we have here is this one moving to left, finding the number that you have here on y axis that is 3. So this is the answer that you should have for left hand limit. We can also substitute for 
instead for x we have 7 minus 4 that is 3 so this is our left hand limit and when x approaches 4 from right limit of f of x is based on this point on this graph find the number that you have on y-axis that should be 5 we can also substitute 4 for x so we have 4 plus 1 that is 5 and this is right hand limit here in this case left and right hand limits are not equal to that means limit of f of x as x approaches 4 does not exist use the graph below to determine the right hand left hand limits at x equal to 1 does limit of f of x as x approaches 1 exist so limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from right is equal to 0 at this point and what we have on y axis is 0 and based on this function that is given limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from right is based on what we have here so this is equal to limit of 0 as x approaches 1 from right so this limit exists but what we have for when x approaches 1 from left what we have here um, for f of x is cosine 1 over x minus 1 so as x approaches 1 from left limit of f of x does not exist that means there is no real number to which the functions values stay increasingly close as x approaches 1 from the left side this means limit of f of x as x approaches 1 does not exist because limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from left and from right these two are not equal to so limit of f of x as x approaches 1 does not exist because the left hand and right hand limits are not equal graph the function then answer these um, questions so here I have this graph based on what is given so starting from the, from the first part when x is between 0 4 and xl also equal to 0 square root of 16 minus x square so I use 0 for x we have 16 minus 0 square inside square root so what we have in that case we have square root of 16 and that is 4 so when x is 0 our answer for y is 4 is this point and when we have 4 this is not equal to that's why we're going to have open circle so it's square root of 16 minus 4 square it's square root of 0 so the answer is 0 so we have this point but that is open circle and then what we have between 4 and 8 x is equal to 4 that means on that part we will have closed circle and the answer for that is f of x is equal to 4 so for both of these when you have x4 and also x less than 8 the answer for f of x is 4 so here we have closed circle with this one is open circle and finally when x is equal to 8 our answer for f of x is based on this point and that is 8 so this is our graph and now we are able to answer these questions what are the domain and range of f 
So domain is what we have on X axis. And the points that we have based on this graph. Our, our graph starts from that point and the point that we have if we move to cross x axis here we're going to have zero now moving to the right to find our interval the last number that we can find here on x axis is eight moving up we have this point and that is closed circle because of having closed circle here closed circle on that part that means we have closed interval so our domain starting from left we have bracket 0 comma 8 bracket so this is closing interval. Now finding range is based on what we have on y axis. The starting point, the point that we have here is 4 and that is open circle. So this 4 is on x axis, what we have on y axis is 0. So we have parentheses. 0, comma, moving up, we have this point, and also we have this one, and that is 4 on y axis. Close bracket. And what else we have here on y axis is only this point. We have nothing between this one and what I have on top. So nothing is here in between. That's why I have to use union combining these two. And here I will use set to write the point that I have here on this part in y axis. So this is our range. Part B at what point C, if any, does limit of f of x as x approaches C exist? In this interval between 0 and 4, we have left hand limit here between 4 and 8. We have right hand limit, so left hand limit, right hand limit as x approaches 4. So we have two sided limit as x approaches 4. But when we have x equal to 0 or x equal to 8, we only have one sided limit. So as x approaches 0 from right, that is our limit and as x approaches 8 from left, we have this point. This means right hand limit at x equal to 0 and left hand limit at x equal to 8 exist. So the function f of x has a two-sided limit at each point in this interval 0, 4, union 4, 8. Notice that the function f of x does not have a two-sided limit at x equal to 0 and x equal to 8. However, the function f of x has a right-hand limit at x equal to 0 and left-hand limit at x equal to 8. Based on what I described here, so we have right-hand limit at x equal to 0 and left hand limit at x equal to 8. Because of that, the point C where limit of f of x, x approaches C exists, those points are um, 
starting from zero, close interval, uh, we have bracket zero, comma four, parentheses union, parentheses four, comma eight, close bracket. So this is our final answer for part B. Definitions. Part A, assume the domain of F contains an open interval C, comma D to the right of C. We say that f of x has right hand limit capital L at C and right limit of f of x as x approaches C from right that is equal to L if for every number epsilon greater than zero there exists a corresponding number delta greater than zero such that absolute value of f of x minus L less than epsilon whenever x between C and C plus delta. Part B, assume the domain of F contains an open interval BC uh, to the left of C. We say that F has left hand limit L at C and right limit of F of X as X approaches C from left is equal to L. If for every number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a corresponding number delta greater than zero such that absolute value of F of X minus L less than epsilon whenever x between c minus delta and c so here is what we have uh, on left side we have intervals associated with the definition of right hand limit so our x is between c and c plus delta for right hand limit and for left hand limit our x is between c minus delta and c so in this case, limit of f of x as x approaches c from right, that is equal to L. And here on right side, limit of f of x as x approaches c from left, that is equal to L. Prove that limit of square root of x as x approaches 0 from right is equal to 0. Let epsilon greater than zero be given, and here in this case, what we have c is zero and l is zero. Um, that's because x approaches zero, and here our answer for a limit says that that is zero. So this is l, and here on this part we have c. So we want to find a delta greater than zero such that absolute value of square root of x minus zero less than epsilon whenever x is between zero and delta, or square root of x less than epsilon whenever x between 0 and delta. Note that square root of x is greater than 0 as absolute value of square root of x is square root of x. Now using second proverb for left and right side we have x less than epsilon squared and that is if x between 0 and delta. And if we choose delta equal to epsilon square, we have square root of x less than epsilon whenever x between 0, delta, and delta here, I said that equal to epsilon square, or absolute value of square root of x minus 0 less than epsilon whenever x between 0 epsilon square. This shows that limit of square root of x as x approaches 0 from right that is equal to 0. Find the limit 
showing how these two loops were root. And between these two, we have negative sign. So this one is equal to limit as h approaches 0 from right. Rewriting what is given and then multiplying numerator and denominator both of these by square root of h square plus 10h plus 13. Instead of subtraction, now we have addition between these two square roots. So we have plus square root of 13. So multiply both numerator denominator by the same thing. So I might multiply both numerator denominator. What I have in numerator is h square plus 10h plus 13 minus 13. So I'll simplify that part. Here we have h square plus 10h. And we write what we have in denominator. Then factor out h. So we have h times h plus 10 divided by denominator. And then we can cancel h from numerator denominator. Now substitute 0 for h. So on top we have 0 plus 10 denominator, we have square root of 0 square plus 10 times 0 plus 13. plus square root of 13. So on top we have 10. Denominator we have 2 times square root of 13. So the answer is 5 divided by square root of 13. Find limit of f of x as x approaches c from right and limit of f of x as x approaches c from left for the given function and value of c. So what we have here f of x is equal to x plus 11 multiplied by absolute value of x plus 9 divided by x plus 9 when c is equal to negative 9. The expression absolute value of x plus 9 for values of x that are greater than negative 9 is equivalent to x plus 9. So for values of x greater than negative 9, our function is so this is given x plus 11 times as the value of x plus 9 divided by x plus 9 that is equal to x plus 11 times absolute value of x plus 9 in this case is x plus 9 divided by x plus 9 so I simplify here we have x plus 11 this means using what we have here for our function x plus 11 finding limit as x approaches negative 9 from right so this one is for values of x greater than negative 9. That means x approaches negative 9 from right. So x plus 11 times absolute value of x plus 9 divided by x plus 9. That is equal to limit. And here we simplified and we had x plus 11. So this is negative 9 plus 11 and that is equal to 2. The expression absolute value of x plus 9 for values of x that are less than negative 9 is equivalent to negative times x plus 9. So for values of x less than negative 9, what we have here is 
x plus 11 times absolute value of x plus 9 divided by x plus 9. In this case, is equal to x plus 11 times negative times x plus 9 divided by x plus 9. So simplify, this is equal to negative times x plus 11. Now finding limit as x approaches negative 9 from left. Here we simplified our function and that was negative times x plus 11. So our limit is equal to negative times. Instead of x here, we use negative 9. And the answer is negative 2. Theorem limit of ratio sine theta divided by theta as theta approaches 0 is equal to 1. Here we have graph of f of theta equal to sine theta divided by theta. This one suggests that the right and left hand limits as theta approaches 0 are both equal to 1. So we have same answer for left hand and right hand limit. That's why limit of f of theta exists. Now what we have here is to find tangent theta that is equal to, so here is our theta. And tangent theta is equal to opposite side. divided by Jason. So that is equal to this side, TA divided by OA. And OA is equal to one. That means what we have here is TA divided by one. So that is equal to TA. Using limit of sine theta divided by theta as theta approaches 0 equal to 1, find the following limit. So this is equal to limit writing these separately and then that is equal to limit I want to write this part as sine y divided by y so what we have here is plus 2 or 9 times sine y divided by y. So that is equal to limit now simplify so we have 7y divided by 9 minus limit 1 over 9 plus limit 2 or 9 times sine y divided by y and for all of these y approaches 0 so this is equal to and now using 0 for y we have 7 over 9 times 0 that is 0 minus limit of 1 over 9 when y approaches 0 is 1 over 9 plus here we have limit of 2 over 9 multiply 
sine y divided by y based on what is given here. As y approaches 0, that is equal to 1. So what we have here is 0 minus 1 over 9 plus 2 over 9. The answer is 1 over 9. Find the limit using limit of sine theta divided by theta as theta approaches 0 equal to 1. So this is equal to what we have in numerator is limit of x times cosecant 2 times x divided by limit of cosine 7 times x for both of these x approaches 0. So rewriting what we have on top in denominator, when using 0 for x, we will have cosine 7 times 0 or cosine 0 and that is equal to 1. So this is equal to limit of cosecant 2x as x approaches 0. Right, cosecant 2x in terms of sign so this is equal to 1 divided by sine 2x so from here this one is equal to limit x divided by sine 2x as x approaches 0. So I'm going to multiply by 2. To be able to write this in terms of sine theta over theta. So that's equal to So multiply both numerator and denominator by the same number. In this case, because of having sine 2x, here I have 2 times x. That's why I multiply by 2 to have the same thing. So whatever you have after sine, that is 2x. I want to have the same thing here on top. So multiply by 2 to have 2x. And here denominator, same thing, multiply by 2. So this is equal to 1 over 2 times limit 2x divided by sine 2x. And that is equal to 1 over 2 times limit Writing this one as 1 divided by sine 2x divided by 2x. So this way we have this one in terms of sine theta divided by theta. So this is equal to 1 over 2 multiplied by 1 divided by sine 2x divided by 2x as x approaches 0 is equal to 1. So the answer is 1 over 2.
for this part, uh, we have to recall that half angle function of our cosine is equal to 1 minus 2 times sine squared uh, x divided by 2. So for this part, recall. So here on this part, we have limit um, of 2 times sine square theta divided by 2 over sine 25 theta as theta approaches 0. This is based on um, what we have for half angle formula. So the one that we have in numerator is based on half angle formula and this is equal to so here in this case, um, regroup the terms to get terms of the form sine x divided by x. So what I have here is um, for numerator, we have two sine square. So what I did, I multiplied by theta and divided by theta, uh, divided by two, put numerator denominator. So here are these two. But this is what I did on top only. Um, so multiply by theta over 2 divided by theta over 2. So in this case, what we have here on this part, we have this one in the form of sine x divided by x. And then because of having this second power, we again multiply by sine theta over 2. And in denominator, we have sine 25 theta. In this case, again, we want to have in the form of sine x over x. So we should have sine 25 theta divided by 25 theta. So here again, I multiply by 25 theta divided by 25 theta. to have this one in the form of sine x divided by x. Now we can uh, simplify. So here, this part cancels. Theta divided by theta, that part cancels. So what's left here on this part is 1 over 25. multiply by what we have on top here is sine theta divided by 2 over theta divided by 2 times sine theta divided by 2. So this is what we have for numerator denominator. Now finding limit, so we have 1 over 25 multiplied by limit of numerator divided by limit of denominator. So limit of sine theta over 2 divided by theta over 2 times sine theta over 2 denominator we have sine 25 theta divided by 25 theta so that is 1 over 25 times Sine theta over 2 divided by theta over 2, that is equal to 1. Multiply by using 0 for theta here, we're going to have sine 0, and that is 0. Now in denominator, we have sine 25 theta divided by 25 theta. Limit for this part based on what we have here. In our theorem, that is equal to 1. So the answer is 0. Use limit of sine theta divided by theta. Here, our limit is equal to limit of 
we can simplify this part. Y over 6 times sine 8x divided by 8x So what we have here is limit of 5 over 6 multiplied by limit of sine 8 x divided by 8 x so that is 5 over 6 times what we have here limit of sine 8x divided by 8x as x approaches 0 that is equal to 1 so the answer is 5 or 6 use limit of sine theta divided by theta to find the following limit. So this is equal to limit of 1 over theta squared multiplied by instead of tangent. Here we use sine divided by cosine, and for cotangent we have cosine divided by sine. And that is equal to limit of 1 over theta squared multiplied by. I multiplied what they have on top, multiplied by what they have here in denominator. So sine theta multiplied by sine 13 theta, that is here on top in numerator. And then I multiply these two, cosine theta times cosine 13 theta, that is in denominator. Now we group the terms to get terms of the form sine x divided by x. Right here, I have to multiply by 13 with numerator denominator. So I can have in the form of sine x divided by x. So what I did, multiply by 13 here, and multiply by 13 in that point. So because of this, we can have sine 113 theta divided by 13 theta. Now this is equal to the finding limit of these terms individually. This is equal to 13 times limit of 1 over cosine theta multiplied by limit of 1 over cosine 13 theta multiplied by limit of sine theta over theta and finally multiplied by limit of sine 13 theta divided by 13 theta. And this is equal to 13 times using 0 for theta we have 1 over cosine 0 and cosine 0 is 1 so it's 1 over 1 multiplied by for cosine 13 theta we have cosine 13 times 0 so it's cosine 0 again it's 1 over 1 limit of sine theta over theta as theta approaches 0 that is equal to 1 that is based on what we had in our theorem. And here, same thing. This is in the form of sine x over x. So we have sine 13 theta divided by 13 theta as theta approaches 0. So that is equal to 1, meaning that our answer is equal to 13.